Today's episode of Socially Democratic is now available on Patreon. Join our Socially Democratic community on Patreon for free or for as little as $2.50 a month and you can help support the show. And when you sign up as a campaign organiser, you get access to our premium episodes, a free ticket to a live show and our haters, hate and the rest vote Labor merch. And we want to thank our latest member of Patreon, uh, Patrick. Thank you very much for joining our Patreon community. And if you've signed up, please check your inbox for a message from our producer uh, who's asking you for your shipping address. We need to uh, we need to get your address so we can send the merch to you. So please check your uh, email. You will receive an email from us. Uh, to join all of these wonderful comrades, click on the link in the show's bio and uh, sign up to Patreon today. Today's episode is also presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a campaign agency that specializes in community organizing. We only work with people that want to build power to make the world a better place, uh, including community-based organizations, trade unions, progressive businesses, and social democratic parties across the globe. And we train engagement staff and volunteers in the Marshall Gantz framework of leadership organizing action. And if you want to create change in your community, in 2024, then hit us up at dunstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. They believe the law should serve everyone, not just those who can afford it. Morris Blackburn has been fighting for workers' rights in Australia for more than 100 years and they've helped more than half a million people get the compensation they deserve. And if you've been injured at work or on the road, you may have a claim through your superannuation. So for expert and empathetic legal support call morris blackburn lawyers today hello and welcome to another episode of socially democratic your weekly center left organizing podcast that is out every friday that dives into the campaigns of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad Um, and we are entering into campaign season and to kick it off we've got the act elections in two weeks time and today we're going to preview that election with good friend of mine, uh, Michael Cooney. Uh, so check that out. And if you like the show, please uh, give us a great review on Apple Podcast uh, and make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to support us by joining Socially Democratic Patreon. And for all other uh, things, follow Dunn Street on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. All right, enough for me. Let's get to today's episode. We are taping this one on a Thursday afternoon on the lands of the Wurundjeri people on a gorgeous day here in Melbourne. Spring has finally sprung in the Garden State. Uh, and uh, it's we're ent- entering into what I would call election season, uh, not just uh, overseas, but uh, here in Australia as well. And in a couple of weeks' time, there is the ACT uh, or the Territory election. Um, and to help me preview this important ballot. Uh, my very special guest today has over 20 years, uh, sorry, over 20 years ago was the policy director for federal labor uh, in opposition speechwriter to none other than Julia Gillard, which was prime minister, uh, as well as leading various think tanks and the Republican campaign there for a while. Uh, these days he's Melbourne based uh, where his day job is the general manager for public affairs at Morris Blackburn Lawyers, our sponsors should have got uh, this bloke to do the reading uh, earlier today. Uh, and his side hustle, he's the secretary of the Celtic Club, which now has a new home at the Wild Geese in Brunswick on the corner of Sydney Road and Brunswick Road. Uh, and do yourself a favour and get along. I am a member of the Celtic Club, obviously, because I'm a cliche. Uh, you should join too. Uh, he's a native Canberran, former chief of staff to the then ACT Planning and Education Minister, now the ACT Chief Minister, Andrew Barr. Michael Cooney, welcome to Socially Democratic. Thank you for having me, Stephen. You're not the first Michael Cooney to be on Socially Democratic. How does it feel to follow your son? I, um, I'm i definitely Michael's father now that we're in Melbourne. He used to be Michael's son and now I'm clearly Michael's father. I, uh, been, um, I know that he came in for a bit of criticism because when he did the episode, like his washing was on the bed behind him <laughs> and, on an unmade bed and like I think his bike was sort of sitting there. Um I'm, I'm cool with it. We've protected him from any of that Jordan Peterson stuff about tidy up your room. Like he's got a very <laughs> healthy masculinity and we're good with it. Right. Anyway, so you're bringing your A game today with your background. So I appreciate that. Um, maybe you're setting a, uh, some, a norm for your son to follow if he ever comes back on the show again. Um, 
let's get into it. ACT elections, you're our expert. You basically are a walking tourism book bureau for the ACT and have been for a very, very long time, as long as I've known you. Unpaid brand ambassador, hashtag CBR. Yeah. Proud, <laughs> yes, proud. Exactly. CBR, that's right. Um, so let's talk about the, let's start with the state of the race for folks that aren't tuned in to the ACT elections. Uh, the campaign officially kicked off on Friday the 13th of September. Election day is on the October 19, so a couple of Saturdays away. Pre-poll opens this coming Tuesday. The incumbent Labor Greens coalition government, led by Chief Minister Andrew Barr, uh, is going for Labor's seventh term, which uh, is a long, long tenure against the Tories, which is led by Elizabeth Lee, uh, who's seeking to form government for the first time in 23 years. Uh, She's also the first Asian Australian leader of any state or territory opposition. Interesting fact. Uh, there are 25 seats in the Legislative Assembly. The magic number to form uh, government in your own right is 13. Um, and we're going to unpack a whole bunch of these seats later. But before we do that, Michael, maybe you can just give us a bit of an overview of the, the, the I guess, the politics and the demographics of the Australian Capital Territory and its uniqueness in our democracy. Delighted to. This is my special subject if I ever go on Mastermind. <laughs> so um, Canberra, the, the ACT is a governing system which combines the state responsibilities of health and education, for infrastructure and so on, with local government responsibilities of parks and playgrounds and rubbish and uh, and local, local government stuff, all those things. So it is uh, a city of these days more than 400,000 people. Um, the territory itself does extend outside Canberra and there are some uh, villages in the ACT, uh, but essentially you're talking about the politics of a, of a, of a big inland city uh, which combines local and, and federal, local and state issues. It's a um, suburban city. Uh, it's a affluent city, but with a, a relatively compressed income spectrum, like it's not a place of um, extremes of inequality at the top end, basically. Um, uh, and it is still uh, a very public sector-centric economy. Uh, public sector demand in the economy in the ACT is pretty similar to what it, to what it's always been, although in the nature of the way government has changed in the way it's delivered over the last 30 years, a lot more people work to government from the private sector than when I was growing up in Canberra. But federal and territory government are still these big employers, as are the uh, the major universities in the city. So it's still very much, uh, uh, it's changed a lot, but it remains a city that's this sort of relatively quiet, suburban, um, white collar, uh, relatively affluent, uh, and and in its physical layout dispersed place to live. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Is it a generalisation to suggest that, uh, like other cities that are the capital uh, of, of of a nation, but is not the, the the you know the big city, and I think the obvious one is Washington DC. Uh, you know, Washington is a Democrat town, um, and could you draw a parallel to the politics and the demographics of Washington DC to that of Canberra that it it inherently should be a Labor town? I think there's a lot in that. It's certainly um, if you think about the demographics of a city that's going to be public sector. It's going to like um, coincide with a lot of the demographics that are going to be predictors of Labor voting. Uh, it's um, but with with traditionally a big exception, unlike DC, unlike other um, strong Labor voting parts of Australia, Canberra hasn't been very ethnically diverse until relatively recently. Um, it is a much more diverse city than it was, uh, but it remains a relatively white place, crudely put, particularly in some of the more established parts of the town. Um, and that's certainly a very unlike DC. Mm. Uh, but um, but in other respects, yeah, it's you know, that, that sort of mix of public sector employment, um, first in family university education, uh, uh, relatively unionised um, uh, through the public sector context, um, universities as employers to complex health systems as employers, yeah. It's not a place with a traditional industrial base, but on the other hand, it's certainly a place with all the other, and it's not a place of a high level of uh, non-English speaking background or, or um, new settlers to Australia relative to safe labour seats in the country. 
but yeah, like, I don't know, presumably Brasilia and Ottawa are, are rather similar in this respect too, yeah. Pretoria. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know little about the politics of Pretoria. <laughs> So let's dive into uh, these electorates and give us a bit of a sense of the diversity uh, or maybe in some cases the lack of diversity. Of, there are five electorates um, and I want to start with, let's go in, am I going to do this in alphabetical order? Yes, I am. Brenda Bella. Let's start with Brenda Bella. Brenda Bella. So yeah, there are five electorates in the city. They're all, they each have five members for them in this multi-member system. So they're all basically the same size. We've got about 60,000 voters. Um uh, with that said, they're all electorates that it would take you, you know, 20 minutes or something to drive across. Like they're relatively suburban electorates for that size. So Brindabella is the southernmost seat in the ACT. It, ex- it includes the National Park and right down to the, to the borders of the, of the Territory. But it's the southern districts of Lanyon and Tuggeranong. Um, by Canberra standards, a bit more tech qualified, a bit less, um, uh, a bit less tertiary qualified. Uh, it includes part the, some of the parts of Canberra that are um, that are mortgage built, out of suburban, um, kind of large houses, heavily mortgaged families, um, and a little more uh, liberal leaning, uh, and in parts a little older, I suppose. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, next on the list, Ginandera. If I pronounce that one right, Ginandera. Ginandera. Ginandera's. Ginandera is at the top end of the city in the north and west. So it's the suburbs of Belconnen. If anyone's ever been to Canberra Stadium or to the Canberra Labor Club, uh, you've been in the seat of Ginandera. Uh, and Ginandera is the other kind of outer suburban electorate in a sense. Um, Ginandera is, uh, however, unlike Brindabella, sort of a safer labour area traditionally, um, particularly the western parts of Belconnen. That's uh, outer suburban, but by by Canberra standards and all these things are, you know, Canberra's a relatively demographically flat city, Mm. but within the context of Canberra's distribution, West Belconnen's got like a relatively high level of public housing uh, and a relatively um, higher level of people living with disadvantage. Uh, So it's it's by Canberra standards a relatively lower income seat. Then moving across to Karajong. Carajong. Carajong contains the Hotel Carajong, where Ben Shifley spent his last night on Earth. Uh, so Carajong's the seat north and south of Lake Billy Griffin. So the, if you've seen Canberra on a postcard, that's probably been Carajong. Uh, it is, uh, it's old Canberra, man. Like it's So on the south of the lake, it's old Canberra. It's, um, you know, big, like it's beautiful, big lawns, lots of trees. They change, you know, change colours. Uh, and uh, it's, the, that part, the what in Canberra is called, the referred to as the inner south, that'd be the hardest part of the city for um, for Labor, uh, in the area where the Liberals really, and but and to a degree the Greens the strongest. It's Marnock Oval uh, would be the the dark heart of NIMBY darkness basically, <laughs> um, and uh, and it's you know, and it also includes the um, all, the most established traditionally. Uh, advantaged areas of the city around Red Hill and, and up on the slopes of Red Hill looking down on the lake. On the north side of the lake, however, it's changed a lot in the last 20 years. So that includes the city centre, Civic, which I, I just it says something about the social democratic character of the place that we don't actually have a central business district that's a bit beneath us, right? We call it Civic, thank you. Mm, um, and then through to Braddon, uh, where that is that is by Canberra standards where your laneway bars and, um, and young renters are. But it rapidly turns back into... Uh, leafy suburbia um, through the rest of the inner north. So it's it's the most difficult part of the city. And unusually, last time, well, I know we'll do seat by seat in the full political sense, but it's the only five-seat electorate in a hair clerk system to have generated two grains um, at any election in Australia, either in the ACT or Tasmania. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm interested to get your thoughts. Why is it this particular part of the electorate do the Greens and the Liberals do well, but Labor struggles somewhat? Yeah, it's um, so, uh, I mean, having said that, Labor got two, the Greens got two and the Liberals got one last time. So it's still relatively larger, but um, it's the area that's oldest, whitest, but also most associated with um, with old Canberra. I remember listening to your conversation with the Chief Minister um, earlier this year and a nice discussion there about kind of older new Canberra and the generational divide almost in the city. Um, and, yeah, <clears throat> the inner south in particular and to a degree parts of the inner north of, like, 
you know, they don't want Canberra to change because it was pretty perfect for them. And in a certain sense, I don't blame them. You know, <laughs> like like if I lived in one of those little AV Jennings play at patches, you know, that are 15 minutes walk from the CBD and all the rest of it, like, and you're sitting on that, you, you're, you're in heaven and why do you want land tax reform, you know? Mm. <laughs> um, uh, heavily retirees. And, you know, it's just self-funded retirees and, um, and uh, people who could do it better themselves a bit, I think. <laughs> Uh, second last, Murrumbidgee. Murrumbidgee, my, my home patch. So Western Creek, Woden and the Molonglo Valley. It's big, it's a very curious electorate, really. Um, so it's the it's the sort of southwest of the city. So north of Tuggeronga, Brindabella, like we just discussed, and south of Carajon that we were just talking about. There's, pre- there's a pretty good chance if you're a staff, you've basically never been to... to, to, uh, to uh, but it, it includes so it includes Western Creek, which is um, not as high income as the inner south, but is like 1970s suburbia heaven, basically. Like it, it's I don't know what the equivalent is in Melbourne, Bundoora or something like this. It's cul de sacs and gum trees and crescents and setbacks and soft curbs and the whole the whole bit. Mm-hmm. Um, sweeping mag sweeping magpies and everything. But uh, following the 2003 uh, bushfires, um, which cleared out uh, a lot of uh, plantation forest west of the uh, city that's actually very close in, we sort of identified an opportunity in the city to develop that valley. So that is basically between Belcon and Western Creek, quite uh, over the western side of the um, of the uh, Arboretum. And it's a very new style place. So it is full of townhouses and even apartment blocks and all these things that Canberra really has never had. Um, and there are right now like nearly 30,000 people living there and it's growing fast. Mm-hmm. And you're out there and it is new Canberra par excellence, right? So it's like a Woolworths metro, right? <laughs> and it's, uh, uh, but also a far more ethnically diverse part of Canberra. Um, and really the, and a lot of people who are newly settling into Canberra and into the ACT and, and their experience is having bought relatively af- relative to say Sydney or Melbourne, relatively affordable, relatively high quality housing uh, in this exceptional natural environment and they're pretty happy out there. And so obviously I'm assuming that Murrumbidgee, it, that is the growth area population wise of the ACT. Yeah, it's like an actual new housing, like a really large new housing yeah. estate. So it's, it's, a, it's most unusual because it is like that, right? So it is like they are cutting new roads and stuff and there's you know, vacant blocks where a new childcare centre is going to go up and stuff like that. But it's closer to the city than most other parts of Canberra. Uh, it's very unusual to have like a really large development like that, um, which is so close to the centre of a of an urban development. Because Canberra is kind of from north to south, it's kind of wasp wasted, and mm. in the middle where the lake is, there's not many people east and west of that. Um, so they're kind of coming and plugging into the middle there. Um, there is still uh, growth to the north of the city. Gungal, and the, which we'll come to last, is, is to the north of the city, has, has continued to grow. But really, other than in Malongo Valley, now where the space is for the ACT to grow is either infill or really in, in what are peri-urban areas outside the territory. So in, in the federal seat of Eden Monero, either in the Yass Valley or on the eastern side of the territory in Queanbeyan and south of Queanbeyan. Yeah, um, right. So from the point of view of the actual ACT, the, the only real growth is going to be in the long run and then in film. Uh, let's talk about that, the very last uh, electorate on the list, uh, Yerribee. Yerribee is basically Gungarland. So it's it, it used to be the future, like I said about Tony Blair. Uh, Yerribee, Gungarland was, uh, uh, is sort of now a finished new development area. It's It, it has more... Um, townhouses and a bit more density than than the kind of the really old 70s Canberra um, <clears throat> and it is also uh, a lot of people who have settled in Canberra for the first time and or settled in Australia for the first time and it is certainly more diverse than uh, old Canberra was um, uh, but it is it is now sort of a, a now a settled place it's not really uh, being done it was at the centre of politics in the ACT for the last 10 years because of the light rail project which linked Gungahlin at the centre of of uh, Yerribee into uh, the city. Um, and with that project now done and uh, the debate moving on to where it goes next, in many, in many ways, Gungahlin's kind of faded uh, from, from that kind of prominence it had in, in territory politics. Yeah, right. Okay, so there you go, Troops. You've got an overview of uh, the demographics and the electorates of the Australian Capital Territory. I want to sort of now sort of talk uh, to you, Michael, about walking into this campaign 
um, how Labor folks would be feeling on the ground. Um, if I can give some context to a, what I'm thinking about the way that elections have been going in this sort of post-COVID era, and I define post-COVID as um, – I define the, the COVID era essentially – March 2020 to December 2021. Uh, so when the, you know, Hogmanay on the 29th of, uh, sorry, 31st of December 2021, bills, bells ring and then that's it, we're done. We're well, opened up and we're all good into 2022. So since then, uh, March 2022, we have the South Australian state election, the incumbent Liberal government loses and Labor uh, returns to the government benches. A couple of months later, in May of that same year, 2022, the federal election is held. The incumbent li Liberal Coalition government loses. Labor has turned to the government benches. In November of that year, the Victorian election is held. The highly unpopular Daniel Andrews uh, was expected so to told. lose. <laughs> Yes, uh, the dictator that is Daniel Andrews. Especially. <laughs> However, Labor holds and is returned with an increased majority uh, to the government benches. The next year, March 2023, we have the New South Wales state election in which the Liberal government loses and Labor returns to the government benches. In A year later, in March 2024, we have the Tasmanian election where the Liberals in government hold uh, and then uh, August this year, we had the Northern Territory elections where the Labor incumbent government loses, the CLPs return for the first time in a number of years. And now we've got two elections coming up in this month alone. We've got the ACT in the middle of October and at the end of this month, we've got the Queensland state election. Now, leaving aside Tasmania, uh, and I think this shows the significance of the, 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 the how good the Victorian state Labor government is that they bucked basically a trend in which post-COVID elections, if you're the incumbent, you're going to lose. Now, going into this election, should should we be worried in the ACT about Labor's prospects or is, this an, is the ACT and its political dynamics isolated from national or, or state-based trends? Or is just Andrew Barr absolutely crushing it and it doesn't really matter? <laughs> is he, do you know what I mean? Like, is he a Daniel Andrews in a small, small town? I don't know. Talk to me what you're thinking about yeah, walking uh, into this ballot. There's something in the idea, I think, that a, a politics of a certain size, you know, a, a polity of a certain size, um, I would say the Victoria and New South Wales are bigger than this, but, but you know, systems like Tassie or the ACT or South Australia, um, if you're the outstanding figure in that polity, you're going to be pretty hard to shift. Um and you know he's my mate, not biased, but but he's a, he, he's the leader. You know I think that's and so God, your first challenge is to persuade people that you've got a, someone who's going to be better at just leading. Um, and uh, certainly his pers his persona isn't that of Daniel, so but you know not unlike Malinowskis um, or some successful Tasmanian premiers, I do think he, he inhabits the space and he kind of he inhabits the role and, and embodies the city in a certain sense. I think they should be most concerned about people thinking they can't lose, mm. like seeking a seventh term but in a city which is easily, uh, you know, caricatured or dismissed as, as uh, a Labor place, um, persuading people that, that their vote matters and they don't have a free kick, I think is uh, is an underlying part of the, the challenge. I don't think that's that's not um, a big part of the public uh, message in the election. This isn't sort of Wayne Goss saying, don't cast a protest vote. Um, but uh, underlying it, I think, is a question about uh, is it a permanent government or is it actually, or, or does this election matter? And honestly, in the nature of Hare Clark, it turns on fine margins. And um, while the path to victory for Labor is clearer than the path to victory for, for the Liberals, like, that's certainly true, I'm not going to be silly about it, you know, there's a path to victory for the Libs uh, and it doesn't require a sea change in territory sentiment or something. Um, it requires, you know, uh, a Liberal opposition ought to be, 
Labor can see a path to get there with the support of independents, just as Labor needs the support of Greens. I don't think this Liberal Party is showing any of the, the chops that would make that happen. Um, but uh, but one thing the Libs probably have in their favour is that they're underestimated. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, and I want to ask you about the Libs in a moment. Maybe we can do a bit of more of a deep dive in terms of uh, Chief Minister Andrew Barr and his leadership. What are the strengths that Andrew brings to the table in this election and, and how does that fit well with the demographics that it, um, he's appealing to? Yeah, look, I, I would describe Andrew Barr as a, an energetic reformer. Um, he's captured the generational change in the city. Uh, Andrew's a, a Gen Xer in a you know, kind of a Gen X city now. Um, uh he, it's our home, uh, Michael. Why am I living in Melbourne? <laughs> you see the forgotten I'm generation. I know, I know. Uh, you know, he's um, uh, in a city which, you know, when you think about what people do for a living there mostly, like a degree of rationality and a degree of um, not only progressive in a social sense, but just a kind of an active, rational, you know, make changes, fix problems, Um Consider the intelligent, consider the issues intelligently, and make your case. That's that style of politics is going to work for you in a city like that. Um, and you know, the, the past, even prior to Andrew Barr being the chief minister, you know, a succession of elections have been really defined by policies that he took to them or defended at them. So you know, from the time of his election, he goes into the. Uh, 2007 election, I'm going to say, as the education minister and the election is really defined by his policies on school closures and the consolidation of the system. Subsequent elections are defined by his policies on land tax reform as treasurer. Uh, and then, of course, once he becomes chief minister, of course, it's going to be defined by your approach in, in that case on 2016 on light rail and in 2020 on, on COVID where he, rightly people saw him standing up. People were right to see him standing up to pressure from uh, New South Wales, from the New South Wales Deputy Premier who lived in Queanbeyan, uh, and from some stupid and irresponsible Brett Canberra Press Gallery journalist still on fly on planes and play golf. Uh, and what the people saw was a bloke who was trying to run the city in their interest. So I think um, he uh, his his manner is the right manner for, for, for this generation's Canberra, yeah. When I interviewed him earlier in the year up in uh, uh, Canberra, uh, what struck me was um, John Armitage, often, often the uh, researcher and Labor Party sort of pollster, talks about the what you want to, what voters want to see in a, in a political leader is uh, either they're competent or they're caring, um, and if you can be both, then that's a magic mix that's rare in political leadership today, right? You're either seen as being incredibly competent, but not so caring, or you're very caring, but uh, are you very competent? And the other thing to build into that, he he sort of updated that after sort of observing Daniel Andrews for a number of years is also is, you know, is your leadership built on wanting to be respected, not liked, and therefore making decisions that may piss off 30% of the electorate and they're loud about it and they're on the front page of the Herald Sun or whatever, but the silent, overwhelming majority actually back you in and respect you for the decisions and not flip-flopping because some leaders can go, oh, I'm getting a hard time by 3AW or whatever, therefore I'm going to now change. When it actually, if you'd stuck to it, you would have been fine, you moron. So what I struck, what struck me the most was coming out of that interview, I was like, oh my God, you are both competent and caring. Like there yes. is a caring factor to and Andrew. He cares about the city. He cares about the people and it's authentic. It's not bullshit, but also he's incredibly intelligent. And from that oozes competency that look, I know what I need to do. I know how to, I know what the final year of this journey looks like. And I know how to get us to that, right? With the levers of government, but also does things that, yeah, are going to piss off some groups, old Canberra, for example, and the tram. We had a bit of a laugh about it both on and off the show, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and he does well, that. I, think, I just want I to think, get your reflections on that. I mean, am I off the mark on that? No, no, I think that's definitely right. It's interesting that that's your perspective of him from that interview. What I think is that um, like he's always been regarded by the electorate as the uh, competent one, uh, and he's certainly always seen himself and been seen as the guy who will push through and persist with a necessary reform, even if, even if people don't like it, you know. Um, like this is a bloke who, when he was closing these schools, went to public meetings and there was some anonymous dude who would turn up at these public meetings dressed as the Grim Reaper. 
because Andrew Barr's the Grim Reaper is going to take you away to school. And also maybe because you're alive in the 80s and you remember something else about the Grim Reaper, like this wasn't great, right? No. And uh, that was his formative experience in territory politics, really, as, a, as, a, as an elected official. And then you wind the clock forward and there's tax and land and, and tram and all the rest of it. I think what was interesting about 2020 was it gave Andrew an opportunity to show the caring bit. People didn't doubt his, um, his common sense and rationality and, and uh, stick to um, But the bit where he was able to confront, like I say, national figures and say, maybe we just put a higher value on human life than you do mm. um, and speak with, quite, speak with some emotion about it. Uh, and I think also the context of society having changed and make it easy, making it easier for him to talk about his own personal relationships and family uh, compared to how, how easy or hard that was 15 years ago. I mean, the people have seen that side of him as well. Yeah. But um, he's certainly not your, uh, your most extroverted or empathetic democratic politician. He's, you know, he's, um, and we tease him that, uh, that uh, the politics of COVID suited him well because he, um, he was forced to make decisions and he was told he wasn't allowed to shake anybody's hand <laughs> This suited his style, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, but actually, I think he showed people him, himself in that in that in that period of people. It's there. It actually is there. And I know that in a podcast format like Social Democratic, which is you know, it's we do try to make it narrative based, and obviously, it's a friendly space. It's not adversarial, so people can open up. But I just. Uh, you know, I know he's a like he's you know he's a, he's, a, he's an air, civil civil aviation nerd. Like he's a nerd at <laughs> heart, but in in that in itself is endearing. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah um, who do you know who's not competent? The Liberal Party. Let's talk about them for a moment. They've got um, some challenges. Wow, <laughs> like, friends. Yeah, I know. Just sort of go through some of the the things that's happened in the last couple of weeks or months. Yeah, so we're there. At, so you know, the fundamental challenge. Uh, Canberra Liberals, as they call themselves, have. So the Liberal Party and the ACT, uh, to your point about you've got to be, at least you've got to be either competent or compassionate, like, so you better be at least one or the other. So if you're going to have extreme and out-of-touch politics, you better at least be rated as being able to run a bath. Um, and at the moment, they'd be scoring poorly on both, right? So fundamentally, their, their challenge is that their party membership and in turn increasingly the candidates um, just don't represent a kind of a... Uh, a Canberra Liberal voter, right? Like, a, like <clears throat> Liberals in Canberra, you know, they're going to be teals, basically, aren't they? They're mm. going to be moderate. They're going to be, you know, somewhat progressive. They're going to be warm and dry, however you want to sort of, whatever picture you want to draw that. And increasingly over the, over the years, really, uh, the Canberra Liberals, by contrast, have been a very conservative Liberal Party. Um, uh, now, you might be able to get away with that if you, if you can sort of persuade the people that there's a problem that needs to be solved and it's time for a strong figure or something. But instead, frankly, what they've got is Elizabeth Lee, who, um, you know, people who were taught by her at uni thought she was a nice lady, um, but that's about that, right? Uh, and uh, with a front bench and group of candidates who are being serially exposed as having um, extreme, in some cases, distasteful or worse politics on, on including on race and other things. So they've got, they've got a candidate who 20 years ago wrote a school textbook um, which if you read, you would get the impression that, uh, that Arthur Phillip arrived with the London Mission Society, not the Royal Marines, mm. um, and provides an, you know, a comically deficient account of imperial colonisation in Australia. Um, he's a shadow attorney general. Um, you've got uh, another candidate who has um, been outed for having a, an, a, a pseudonymous Facebook uh, profile, uh, and uh, he's got a lot of feelings about race, which he expresses under this fake name, let me tell you. <laughs> um, and uh, they're both in Ginadera, by the way, and then a third candidate, and then one of their MPs they've sacked, um, who's now become a crossbencher and will run for re-election as a so-called family first candidate. Um, a mate of mine was describing this situation to me, and he said, I wouldn't have advised her to say the security footage was doctored. <laughs> I reckon that's that's probably good advice in general. Like whatever the situation, like the, that's not going to be your best line. Uh, so she's accused of having slapped a party official. Which, to be fair, we've also like who hasn't wanted to slap a party official? You know? <laughs> right. But, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, and there's there's sort of there, there's other accusations circling in the background. So yeah, they are a mess, particularly in Ginadera, which actually might you know on their path to victory as it were would be a pretty key seat. But at the same time, they're seen as being pretty out of touch. Yeah. It's a bad combination. 
Uh, it's interesting you just raised the question about the teals. I mean, are there any sort of teal type candidates that are running in this race that would benefit from what's going on internally within the Liberal Party in Canberra? There's, a, there's not a kind of, so no one's running as a community independent under that sort of banner or with that with the support of that network. There are some, in, there are some, uh, and people in, because of the way the ballot paper works, if you want to run as an independent in practice, you need to form an independent grouping so you can get in your own column on the paper. Um, so the independents have got any chance have got to form some kind of network. Anyway, so there's a there's a um, an independent running in the Woden based seat uh, who is a kind of an a, a government critic on strongly local planning related issues, um, who wouldn't be seen as a naturally left or right kind of candidate and ran last time and got sort of seven percent and might be a chance to, to gain some. And then there is a there's a group. Uh, branded something like Canberra Independents, um, who are supported by a network with Senator David Pocock, who's the independent senator for the ACT, who's kind of both an environmentalist and like who appeals to both green voters and teal voters, crudely speaking, yeah. um, very much his own man too. Um, so, but they're not supported by, uh, and the nature of the financing system and other aspects of the city, including the um, the fact you can't hand out votes on election day and so you can't hand out how to vote on election day and so on means that there's not the same capacity for a full for the full teal symphony of of eastern melbourne or or northern and eastern sydney so we haven't spoken about the greens yeah. um tell us about what are the what are the greens like in canberra compared to say here in melbourne yeah, look, they are different, it would be fair to say. I mean, they've, they've got broadly good intentions, as it were. They certainly haven't been the wrecking ball we see in other places. They don't have the, you know, post-Stalinist faction that the New South Wales Greens have got. They, um, they don't have the kind of soap opera and personality problems of the Victorian Greens, all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, I would say that. And their leader, um, uh, Shane Rattenbury, is a pretty responsible and respected kind of He's, he's actually an environmentalist, amazingly enough, for a Greens party politician. Yeah. Um, so they are a very. They're a rarity different. these days in the Greens. They really are. Like the like the NGO strand of Greens party politics is much attenuated, even out of Tassie, really. So you know, to be fair to to Shane Rattenbury, he's that kind of Green, and in personality and in some respects, you know, closely resembles the Chief Minister, to be honest. Um, but as they've gotten larger, that's clearly filled up a party room with people who've got who've got. You know more more green politics, and you know I think they're caught between are they a faction in the government or are they uh, an opposition to the government? Broadly, to be fair, they've operated as a faction in the government. I think is the way I would put it in our terms. You know, um, they've differed from the op- they've differed from the government at times. They've differed from the cabinet at times, but they've broadly been part of a fairly of a of a fairly stable arrangement. You've got to acknowledge that. But I wouldn't say they are a group that see the big picture. Um, they they've got a lot of roots in kind of yeah, communal politics that are about stopping a house getting built at the end of my street because there'll be too many of the wrong kind of people in it. You know, there's, there's plenty of that going on in Territory Greens. It must break the brains of their green c- colleagues in other states whose whole purpose in life is simply to tear down the Labor Party, but here they are in a coalition with the Labor Party governing to try mm. and make the lives mm. of Canberrans better. Mm. Um, and look, if you're, the, the if you're a Greens voter... You, you know, if you're a Greens voter who wants um, ambitious targets for climate change or ambitious investments in public transport and so on, um, you would see that you would be seeing the benefit of a responsible Greens party which works with Labor um, and sure has a role in the game theory of keeping Labor honest or whatever. But, you know, you would see the, the benefit of a responsible Greens party and what that can deliver in a city by contrast with the irresponsibility you see in the other. I mean, off, don't even start me on Brisbane Greens, bloody hell. Mm. So, you know, what you're seeing, what you're seeing in the territory is a bit different, yeah. We uh, will have, we'll be starting our uh, weekly Queensland election uh, uh, breakdown with uh, Jackie Trad and uh, Evan Moorhead next week. So I'm sure oh, we'll be getting fantastic. lots of opinions on the Greens, uh, the Brisbane Greens in those episodes. So I'll be looking yeah, forward to that. We're getting thoughts and feelings, I reckon. That'll oh, be yeah, absolutely. And I'm here for the feelings, absolutely. <laughs> um, so a uh, bit of a plug there for folks um, next week. Uh, issues. 
more of the issues. issues. Michael, tell us about the issues in uh, the ACT that's going to shape this election. Well, because the ACT, as special as it is, is in Australia, you'll be amazed to discover that cost of living is a significant issue in the ACT election. There is no doubt about that. And while the ACT is uh, an affluent city, um, it's an expensive city because it's an affluent city. You know, it's an expensive. It's not a competitive supermarket market, even by Australian standards. It's not a competitive petrol market, even by Australian standards, and so on. So, you know, the it's a it's a, it can be an expensive place to live as a retiree or a middle class family or key workers or whatever. So, like, I think that's critical in the campaign. Labor's said a lot about it: energy bill rebates, doubling free preschool. Uh, which is which will save a family like two and a half thousand dollars a year. Um, free Fridays on bus and light rail, um, mm. which obviously saves the family budget, uh, but also brings business and life to the to the you know public transport hubs, including the centre centre of the city. Yep. Um, so cost of living is critical. It's an ACT election, so it's it always starts with proper municipal issues. And Labor did something interesting this year by launching local area plans, like I mean, like new parks, new footpaths, shopping centre access, you know, there's a big car park here, but we can't push a trolley to the, to the you know, to the um, shops. Um, yeah. That kind of really, you know, bread and butter, city city level issues. They launched that stuff as far back as July, August. Um, and that's allowed candidates to, well, partly to play a role in the development of those plans, but also then to get out on the cell and talk about some of those really bread and butter local issues. And then it's health, education, infrastructure and housing. It's a, and it shifts into a, a, a state, uh, a state style campaign. There's some, there's some interesting contrasts there I can go to if you like. Yeah. Well, let me, let, let's talk about that because we've got a bit of time before we jump into the actual seats and yeah. where we think the pathway to victory is for the parties. What's some of those other issues that are going to sort of play well, out? Housing, like the government's really been defined for years by its policy to replace stamp, to phase out stamp duty and replace it with land tax. And I know that the chief spoke to you at length about that when he spoke to you earlier this year. Uh, the Liberals have been on the wrong side of history on this fund all the way through. Um, and it's making a difference, including to the public finances, as well as making a difference to the, to the housing market and to access. And the Territory's also in a fortunate position, by, uh, like as well as working hard, they are um, because they are a land developer themselves and, and have, have some levers, uh, they'll meet their targets on the National Housing Plan and they'll, they'll have the Territory Labor will have 30,000 new homes built over the next six years by 2030. So, like, that's, you know, for everyone, that's the kind of... If, if cost of living is, like, obviously the screaming issue of the day, I think for everyone, housing is the big anxiety, the big unanswered, but, like, how are we going to f- crack this nut for the next generation? Um, and in a territory system, because you've got planning, because you've got home, because you've got land development and so on, you've got a particular obligation to it, but also some opportunities to fix it. <clears throat> so there's, there's always been a contrast there. On, on health, I would say it's, you know, Labor's backing nurses and the Libs are backed by GPs crudely. So Labor's going to um, uh, strengthen its nurse-led walk-in centres, which are extremely popular, which are um, good for anyone who's in a hurry to get, you know, basic care, primary care, um, but also are a reform that reduced the cost of the, the health system overall. Um, Naturally, the Libs are backed in GPs uh, and support the GPs because that's kind of what they do in, in you know, interest group terms. But Labor's all, Labor, this was really how Labor spent the opening the, the five weeks out from the campaign on those issues, plus also the, North, the new Northside Hospital, which is in the, in the Calvary Precinct in, uh, you know, Bill Connor near the, near the stadium where you've been. So that's really the health fight. And then on education, I'd say it's Labor's on No Child Left Behind and the Libs are on Back to Basics. That's because the Labor's like got every high school are getting a Chromebook, um, expanding the meals in schools program. So now 8,000 students will get a free breakfast and lunch three days a week. Um, heating and cooling upgrades uh, in the schools. Um, a topic of deep importance to the uh, Chief Minister's origin story of wearing the wrong jumper to school and becoming an activist as a result. Um, <laughs> Whereas what the Liberals have talked about, I'm not sure if they've got a credible policy here, but they've talked about kind of getting back to basics on reading and writing and arithmetic and um, just sort of a stereotypical conservative outlook on that. Um, although I must say, I'm, I'm all for what uh, Victorian Labor and some other state governments are doing on uh, on uh, on how reading is taught. So that's health and education. And then finally, infrastructure. There's an interesting direct contrast on infrastructure. So Labor will extend the light rail project across the lake and all the way to Woden. Uh, 
the Liberals will abandon it once it stops at Wills. We'll have it stop at Barton, basically just go across the bridge and stop it in the parliamentary triangle. And they say they'll spend the money on a lakeside football stadium, um, uh, which Labor says won't fit in the space they've got. Will cost a bomb and will probably, you know, sink into the lake because it's so close to the water. Um, yeah, right. But that's a really clear contrast that the light rail to Woden versus a lakeside stadium. Tories love a stadium, don't they? Yeah. I mean, to be clear, I'd love Cameron to have a new stadium too. But, but, but I don't think it fits on that side. Is <laughs> this for, I think is it, it goes to the competence thing too. Like I think if Andrew Barr said I can put a stadium in that spot and it'll make and the numbers will add up, I think people would believe it. I think if Elizabeth Lee says here's a CGI picture of a stadium and I promise it goes there, I'm not sure anyone's really convinced. Yeah, yeah exactly. Let's talk about the seats. Um, five, there are five, as you said before, it's um, Hair Clark. Don't need to go over that. If you do want to know what Hair Clark is, go back and listen to the Jack Milroy ones we did with the Tasmanian election, so we don't have to repeat ourselves. <laughs> Multi member electorates, five members in each electorate. Currently, as it stands, Labor has two, and correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, Michael, Labor's got two in all uh, one, two, three, four, five that of the electorates. Correct. Uh, the Greens have one in all of them except for Currajong, where they have two, and therefore yes. the Tories have two in all of them except for Currajong. Correct. Uh, Labor needs to pick up three seats to win government in its in in uh, in their own right. Yep. Um, can you see us achieving that, Michael Kearney? And if so, where would we look out of those seats to do so to pick up those think, additional seats? I mean, I'd love us to get to 13. I think the fun scenario is that Labor gained seats off the Greens in Brindabella and in Ginandera, so in those two outer seats, and is much stronger in the Cabinet, like a 12-member, including bringing some new talent in as well, but as a stronger hand in negotiations for the Greens. I think 13 is a stretch. I don't think many people will be predicting Labor actually gets to a majority government. The Territory's only had one majority government, uh, and that was in 2004 when John Stanhope was... Um, rightly considered a bulletproof hero for his um, defence of the city during the bushfire crisis of mm. January 2003. So it's a, it's a system for minorities, but Labor could be a stronger minority. So that's kind of the fun scenario. Yep, There's sort of a boring scenario, which is not at all unlikely, I suppose, where there's not much change. Maybe the Libs take a seat back off the Greens in Carajong, but not a lot else shifts. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, look, there's a scary scenario where... Uh, the Greens do poorly and lose to independents in maybe, well, in Ginandera, say, um, where there's an incumbent Liberal running for re-election as an independent. Um, maybe lose to an independent in Murrumbidgee, to this sort of, to, which is the um, Woden Western Creek area, where I was saying before there's a, like a, a high-ish profile local running there. The Greens could lose to a Liberal in Brindabella. Could get, Brindabella could go back to being a th- three Liberals to Labor. Um, and the Liberals could take a seat back off the Greens in Currajong. That's really that was extremely close last time. It's pretty unusual for the Greens to get two two out of five. In that scary scenario, the Chief needs one of those independents to get re-elected. Mm. Um, so you know, there's not a there, there's not a there's not no path to a bad result. But the most likely scenario is somewhere between fun and boring. Yeah. An interesting detail just to cover this. This is an interesting bit about the way it works. So in the territory, there's not an administrator of the. Australian Capital Territory or a kind of a little, you know, lieutenant governor or something who um, calls someone into, you know, government house in some three-bedroom flat in Braden or something. Like that's it, What actually happens is the assembly forms is, is declared elected, then the 25 of them meet and elect a, and a clerk runs a ballot for the speakership and then the speaker runs a ballot for the chief ministership. Hmm. So the thing actually gets to... And then the chief minister appoints a cabinet um, and obviously... In the kind of coalition context, the chief minister's done a deal which has been published about what that will look like. So that is an interesting bit here that the uh, that independents and others they don't get to do this kind of sort of somewhat Tasmanian scenario where you sort of drag your feet and go, oh, okay, we'll let Rockcliffe form government, but you know we'll keep an eye on him or whatever. Like you've got to vote for them, and and that does have an interesting effect of stabilising it. Um, but it does mean that if Labor and the Greens are 12, say, of the 25 seats, that, you know, it's genuinely going to be up to any other independents as to whether they want a continuation of the government or a change of government. You didn't, um, or maybe I missed it, Michael, you didn't uh, highlight any seats, uh, any, any electorates where Labor would be vulnerable to dropping 
a member? Is there any there that I think and I'm that's probably at, right? Yeah, when you think about it, two out of five, the quotas, the, the, you know, the quotas, whatever that makes it, thirty three percent, right? Um, so the second quote is thirty three. It's not. It's not an obvious place where Labor is particularly vulnerable to losing one of its current two seats. I don't think. Um, in Brindabella, the southern seat, Labor's got a retiring incumbent, uh, but has two, uh, well, has four candidates running for that vacancy, as it were, and two of them in particular um, are working very hard. Louise Crossman is a friend of the show, um, and uh, well, a hard, hard working Michael's out there with a, a three month old on her hip door knocking. It's always a, you know, it's great to see. Um, and uh, she's very much a local who listens. So, you know, we're, we're pretty strong in that seat where we've, where we've got someone retiring. And across the board, like, Gin and Dare is a seat where we, where we, maybe we've got a cheeky chance of gaining a third. I don't think we're, I don't think we're really defending our second spot there. Funnily enough, Yerra would be the central seat, you know, maybe in a bad day or a bad, or in a bad result, that might be the one. Um, but that's where the Chief Minister runs. Uh, and so it's, it's, it, it, sorry. Talking about Carajong. Carajong is the one where the chief minister runs in the central part of town. Uh, Ita and Yerribe are both uh, ones where Labor's probably got a not going to get three for a long time to come, but also not going to drop below two for a long time to come. And the, the real question is whether it's a Liberal or an Independent or a Green in that fifth spot. So, I mean, that's interesting that you just what you've gone through there. Brenda Bella, uh, the primary vote by electorate for Labor at the last election, uh, Brenda Bella is our strongest performing seat. We got forty point seven percent of the vote. Uh, Brenda Bella, we went within a we went within an ace of uh, of winning three seats last time. I think it was like eighty votes of the final elimination. Yeah, right. Um, Jim yeah, Dara, not Kevin much. Bottom did a good analysis of this. Like across the board, last time we averaged like. 2.34 quotas or something like this, right? Uh, which really should get you, a, you would expect to get a third seat in one of them. Uh, and yeah, we missed it by 80 votes in Gin and Dera. Sorry, we missed it by 80 votes in Rindabella down in the south. And we missed it by about 170 votes in Gin and Dera. In the north. 40% so they're primary. Places where, yeah, they're both Gin, Gin and Dera, 40% primary last election. Yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, and then like you move down the list then, Karajong, 38% primary at the last election. So two points there. Pretty similar. Um, Murrumbidgee, thirty six point one. Yeah. Yerribee's the lo- is, is our smallest, thirty four point two percent. Tories poll forty. That's their strongest um, <clears throat> uh, electorate. And um, and just yeah. So I mean, to give you some sort of hmm. like if you look yeah, at yeah, the work's going to be done. But realistically, in a situ- in a multi member five seat electorate in Canberra, Labor should. You know, it's a bit like a, a football team that should definitely get out of the group. You know, like the yeah. like Labor should get two out of five in those seats. Like it would be a yeah. sh- it would be a very poor performance. Yeah, this so is maybe Europe would, would be the one that we might be worried about. That, but you know, but it, I don't think it doesn't feel like in this election there's an, an a place where we're where we're concerned about going backwards. Yeah, right. Okay, very good. I should um, say with all that another weird thing about the ACT is there has been no I don't believe there's been a published poll on ACT politics since the last election. There certainly has not been a published poll on ACD politics this year. Um, this is politics without polls, which is, I mean, obviously the parties are now doing research, but um, but there is no published polling on ACD politics of any reliability, which is a remarkable fact about a city that size. It was bizarre because when we were obviously preparing for this episode and we were looking for polling to discuss, couldn't find any. And it was like, that can't be right. But no. It's all like, right. I mean, most governments in Australia operate under too much pressure and make a mistake as a result. Like you wouldn't mind an occasional wake up call if you're trying to if you're trying, if you're running the territory government for Labor into a seventh real into a seventh election campaign, you wouldn't mind some moments where you could tell people to like, you know, straighten up and fly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, your plans are you heading up to your hometown for the election i'm going to shame you here if you're not it's going to look bad but michael I'm, what are you doing I'm not, well i'm not sure i will be i am um, last time i was in my backyard and you know uh, the victorian premier wouldn't let me go <laughs> 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 so that was a piss uh 2016 i got to um i got to welcome the chief minister to the stage actually that was a lot of fun i think i had more fun than he did <laughs> yeah. and he was he was having fun um no, I'll definitely give him a ring after uh, after six o'clock on the night, but um, but uh, I'll probably decide on the Friday. Yeah. 
Fair enough. Well, uh, to any of our listeners, you can't come from... and hand out. They won't let you hand out. So all you're doing is bludgeon. Like there's nothing else you well, do. But you can knock doors beforehand, and um, I'm sure that there is a um, link on our bio for folks who want to volunteer for the Labor Party in the lead up to this election. Go knock some doors, have some conversations. It's the most effective thing that you can do to shift a vote in this time. Yeah, no more, it? no more beautiful city in which to door knock either. And it's um, you know, spring in Canberra. I mean, obviously you'll need a hat and you'll need walking shoes because the doors are a fair way apart by Australian standards. Yeah. But um, but it's a great place to campaign. It is, absolutely. Um, rivaled only by their autumn. Canberra's autumn is spectacular. True, that is true. Not so keen on their winters. But, uh, <laughs> you can't. This is the. It comes as a package deal, mate. Like that. I know. <laughs> I know. Very good, uh, Michael Kearney. Long time coming for you to come on the show. Appreciate your uh, insights into your home territory and home city for this ep- uh, for t- particular episode. We must get you back on uh, in the future to just talk more politics. A bit of a light, and hello to everyone at home who's listening. Hey there, thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.